Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Professionals. I'm Terry Watkins, your host, and thanks for tuning in to be here with us today. I have the one and only Augustus Cho with us. For those of you who don't know who Augustus is, he is a professional actor, and he's here with us today to share with us a little bit more about what it's like to act. Hi, Augustus. Welcome. How are you, Terry? Good meeting you. Thank you for having me. I am wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us and our middle school students. Hey, so Augustus, as a professional actor, what does that (laughs) entail? What does that look like? Let me see. You know, I think that there are at least four qualities that potential actor or actresses will need in the future. And one of them is professional attitude. And I think we all know what that means. You show up on time, you know your lines, and you do what is required on the set. And second thing is you need a certain amount of talent or a certain skill set. Obviously, you don't just show up from a street and then start acting. You actually have to have some understanding of what acting is and what the psychology of that is. And third thing is you need a broad knowledge of what it takes to fulfill your role as an actor or actress, either on set, on TV or films. And fourth is that it's very important to realize that it's a job and it's not a self-identity. And if you are here to be in the movies or TV to find yourself, then you have bigger life issues and have the wrong motivation for being in this particular field. And I'm gonna discuss that and break that down a little more, uh, I think in a later question where it kind of asks similar question in a broader way. So hopefully those four things, professional attitude, talent, knowledge, and realization. That's awesome. And and it's such a good point and something to keep in mind that it is a job. It's not just a game. You have to show up like you would if you were showing up for any other job and have your best professional foot forward. Thank you for that wonderful reminder. We appreciate that. Hey, Augustus, at what point in your life did you realize that you loved acting and performing? I think since the advent of television back in the 40s and 50s that we all used to watch so many hours of it, most everyone probably wondered at some point in their life what it's like to be an actor or an actress on TV show or on TV. But the challenge is, does one get the opportunity to do that? But 99% of humanity will never get that opportunity. So in my case, It took place later in life because this was not something that I strived for or dreamed about when I was growing up because I had other priorities as an adult, such as graduate school and raising families and that sort of thing. But, you know, life uh, is like an ocean with waves and you can't really control the water or the uh, power of nature. So you have two choices when all these waves come at you. Uh, You can either let the waves wash over you and you keep your head uh, struggling to breathe, or you can ride the waves like a surfer. In the same situation, you have two different outcomes and the choice is yours. So in my case, the opportunity came and I decided to ride the waves and have fun and see where it goes. And here we are, and I have the pleasure of talking with you, Terry, and all the middle schoolers at High Point High uh, Middle School, I guess, Friends School. Yes. That's such a good point. We do have this wonderful thing that happens in life and it, life is a lot like the ocean. Can't control what happens to us, but we certainly can control how we react to what happens to us. Such a great reminder for all of our middle schoolers who are tuning in. Hey, it's often said that in order to make it as an actor and acting, you have to be in certain cities like Los Angeles or New York City. Have you found that to be true for yourself? Why or why not? Yes and no. And let me see if I can break that down and unpackage it for you. First part is yes, in the sense that the primary level of casting for major characters are generally done in Hollywood. And I think everybody understands that. And then the secondary uh, level of cast of characters are done regionally and the extras and the backgrounds are done locally. So obviously, uh, if an individual seeks more film roles bigger uh, in bigger capacity, then chances of that happening are greater if you live in LA for film, or if you lived in New York 
for theater or in Atlanta for TV these days. So in that regard, depending on what your agenda is, it does help to be in front of the big players, you can say. But also the answer is potentially no, because in the end, if they want you, they will cast you regardless where you're from. For example, in my particular case, I played a North Korean leader in the movie called G.I. Joe 2 Retaliation. And you can bet that they tried to cast that particular role in Hollywood. And obviously there are thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of actors out there that would have liked to have been cast for that particular role because the character plays an integral role, role in the story of the movie. Now, it blows my mind that they were not able to cast that particular character in LA because there's so many Asian actors out there in LA, much less the whole state is full of actors. And this country has so many Asian actors and not to mention all these actors from Asian countries. The statistics of becoming an actor is, is very, very against you because the numbers are so high. But for whatever reason, they did not fill their role in LA. And one day when I was cast of auditioning for something else in Wilmington, North Carolina, when they sort of had a film industry, they asked me to audition for this role. They didn't tell me what it was and I have no idea. And often they don't tell you because they don't want these things to leak out and that sort of thing. And I understand them. And the casting director uh, asked, didn't really know much about it in, uh, himself. So. We went through it and he told me basically what the character was. And so we went through the motions. And then a couple of weeks later, I went back there to audition for something else called TV show called Eastbound and Down. And so after that, they he told me to come in and said, um, you know, because last time I was there, he didn't have anything for me. So this time he had it for me. So we filmed it and that was it. Three months later, I've forgotten all about it. Three months later, I get this phone call and I get this particular phone message from my agent. She's all excited, you know, oh, blah, blah, blah. You're casting this G.I. Joe movie and you're doing this, you're gonna be the North Korean leader and when did you audition for it? And I'm thinking, I have no idea what she's talking about because you audition, you know, number of things. And usually you remember some of them, but I, I don't think too much about it, so I forget it. Otherwise you get too many, it's like hard drive with too many things and a lot of junk in there. And when she asked me, when did you audition for it? Because usually the agency sends you to be auditioned, you know? And she did not recall sending me for this particular, I said, I have no idea. And then, I, then I thought about it for a while. And I was thinking, oh, it must have been that, that kind of a unnamed character that I auditioned three months earlier. And sure enough, that's what it was. And she told me, oh, they're gonna fly you out to New, uh, New Orleans and you're gonna be doing this and that, put you up in a hotel, all those things. And that's how it happened. So bottom line is, um, if they want you, they will take you. But in general, it's for the uh, edification of the people who are interested in uh, the business of casting. Casting, I think, works in two ways, kind of a conscious way and kind of a subconscious way. Now, in my particular case, they were unable to fulfill this role in LA either because they had some preconceived notion of this character and what he would look like, but they couldn't find it. Subconsciously, on the other hand, they have no idea what this character looks like. So until they see somebody, they, have, they don't know. And then when they saw my audition, they could, ah, that's him. And I think that's how often characters play out. A lot of directors and casting directors really don't know. They kind of have an idea of, okay, we want, you know, five foot six male uh, with the certain features, but they don't have a face for it. And that being the case, this is your opportunity then to give them what you think they want. And this is all the mysteries of uh, auditioning. But in the end, whether you live in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, or 
triad area in North Carolina, if they want you and you have the look that they're looking for, either consciously or when they look at you, whatever it is, then this, yeah, that's the person and they will cast you. So the key is though, you have to show up for it. You have to be there and be willing to step in. Yes. And so in that regard, living in LA or New York or Atlanta helps a great deal. But I live in North Carolina because this is my life and I'm, I'm happy with it. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that story with us because it really does show that if you have a passion for something and you just keep showing up, you just never know when it's going to come to fruition. You've got to just keep planting those seeds. So as you go through life as, as a middle schooler, high schooler, college student, wherever your life takes you, always think about planting the seeds and what seeds are you planting? Because three months down the road, six months down the road, one of those seeds might just sprout up and become something that you never could have imagined. That's so cool. That is true. Yeah. So if you were to inspire a young person, say somebody who's in middle school, who's felt the calling to be involved with acting professionally, what would you tell them that they should do? Well, I think there's several aspects that the middle schoolers, as well as anybody else, need to understand. The first is technical aspect of being an actor. You have to learn the various aspects of the entire industry and not just acting. Uh, just because you make selfies or you make little short uh, videos with your tele- with your phone for your friends and families, that does not qualify you to be an actor or actress. Uh, you really have to understand what the camera is, what the light, how the lighting works, the, the sound system, independently and as well as comprehensively, and how all these things put together produce a certain uh, aspects of filming or the TV industry. And that's an aspect that people need to understand. You know, so that's different. not just the producer's job. That's the right. actor's job too. Yeah, they will set everything up, but you have to understand how the lighting works and how you maximize that light, where the camera is, you have to understand that and how all the things will come together. So you have a complete understanding of what your role is within that context of the entire set. Having said that, acting is not rocket science. You don't have to be brilliant to be an actor and succeed. And, and we know a lot of actors, I'm sure, that can deliver great lines. But when you ask them a question, they go, huh? They can read lines very well, but that's about it. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be an actor. But it's at the same time, it's not really a reality show either, because the reality show is not acting on a professional level. So when you watch these reality shows and you think, I can do that, no, you can probably do that, but that doesn't make you an actor or an actress because a true actor actor or actress will learn every aspect of the profession because it all fits in the end, it all comes together. Hence the comprehensive knowledge of the industry is an asset and that's the technical aspect of it. So you don't wanna limit yourself just in front of a so-called front of the camera because that will limit how you come across. The, broad, the more understanding you have of how technology works and comes together, then you can present yourself in a more uh, intelligent aspect and present your best. Now, that was the first one that's technically, right? psychologically or state of mind, I wanna emphasize this. You have to realize that this is a job and not an ego trip. A lot of young people think that this is an ego trip. You wanna be famous, you wanna be popular. They're also not the appropriate reasons. Because in the end, it's a job, you're playing a role. You're playing a character, whatever that character is. Hence, the character is not you and you are not the character. And often young people confuse that. If I play a certain role, then that's who I am. No, you are you, you play a fictional character. So to allow one's identity based on a fictional character is essentially stupid. So when you see films or TV shows and you see characters, you're not seeing who they are. They are portraying a certain person for a purpose, but that's not who they are. And a good actor or actress separates the two in their head very clearly. For example, if you're cast as president, does it make you a president? So you have to understand that production people on set are not treating you very nicely because you are so special. 
and they will treat you nicely if you're a principal character and actor, very nicely. Do you have personal assistance and they give you a trailer and all these other things, they, they will cater to you. Mr. Cho, would you like some more water, blah, 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 all these things. But you have to really understand that they're not treating Mr. Cho because he's so special in that manner. What they're doing is they're treating the character you're portraying well in order to get the best performance out of that character by treating you well. That's it. So if you're a good human being, the chances are you will also still be a good human being as an actor. But if you're not a good human being, in essence, then you will not be a good human being as an actor either. And you know who they are on TV. You, you read about them in, what was it, Inquire Magazine or wherever it is, all these TV shows. You know who they are because they cannot separate who they are versus the character they're playing. So remember that. They're not treating you up because you're so special. And a lot of young people confuse this when they're in the industry. They will treat you very, very well. But it's because they want to treat the character well so you can portray that character, not because you're so special. If you can keep that separation, then you can enjoy the experience. Definitely so first, good to keep yeah. in mind because we've yes. got to separate ourselves from the work that we do. Yes. So first one is technical aspects. Second one is psychological or the state of mind. Third thing is, let's talk about rejection. It's the norm, not the exception. If you audition 100 times, you may get one role. And that's the way it is. So if Ooh, you're the sensitive that's really type. really important to know. Like yeah. this industry has a ton of rejection. So if you don't handle rejection well. That's something that you're going to want to work on if this is an industry that really excites you or inspires you. Yes. And because rejection is the norm and not the exception, if you're the sensitive, sensitive type, then don't bother. You're not going to make it. Fourth point is, it's a very, very competitive business. This is probably one of the most competitive business, businesses in the industry. There are easily over 5 million actors and actresses vying for roles. And that 5 million was a data based on IMDb about several years ago. So maybe today we're talking 6 or 7 million people who want to be an actor. Now, within those 7 million people, they're special people, but you're not one of them. And you should not think of yourself as being special because they can find... A, a character just like you somewhere. If they need a five foot nine male with athletic build, with dark hair, they've got millions of them to cast. So just because you're that type doesn't make you special. And also what they're seeking today, they don't need tomorrow. So this is a very competitive business where you, you're competing against millions, literally millions of people. And bottom line, if you think you're so special, you're not gonna make it. So if you're emotionally unhealthy, or even worse, egocentric now, then auditioning and being rejected will make your condition probably worse because this is not for you. However, if you're emotionally healthy, then this will make you stronger and give you a stronger drive. Because in the end, unlike YMCA soccer program or some high school soccer program, you, will, you don't get a participation trophy just so that you will feel special and may feel valuable. Because this is a business, it's cut and dried. They don't really care how you feel because they don't need you. They can find somebody else just like you or pretty close to it who may offer something else. So they are so busy worrying about the pro uh, production they have zero time for your personal feelings. So realize that rejection is the norm and competition is immense. Fifth point, there are protocols in this business. That means there are certain mannerisms that you have to have that you have to have when you're on set. And you need to learn them. Because there are certain protocols on every set, every film, or even as well as TV shows that you do not cross. Now, Hollywood liberals, when it comes to politics, they espouse socialism which, in which everybody's equal, supposed to be treated equally. However, the irony is when it comes to production of film or TV, that is not the case. There's a 
very clear pecking order on the set, which is ironic. And you need to learn that pecking order. Otherwise, you'll be out of bounds and impact production. Learn what those rules are. Stay in your lane until you become a bigger person. For example, if you're an extra or day player, you're not going to come to the area where the principal characters are for snacks or for breaks. And they have separate locations. And you need to stay where you are. And, and the other characters, the major characters, have their own place. And they don't cross. And when you eat a certain point, you have, there's also eating pattern as well. So these are things that you have to learn. Otherwise, you will affect production. Hopefully that helps. That's very interesting, very insightful. I had no idea there were different sections of where actors and actresses could mingle or co-mingle or not in this case. Don't, they don't they don't mingle. <laughs> they don't mingle. That's very interesting, but it's a really important points that you made about keeping that ego in check, remembering that just because you have this opportunity doesn't make you better than greater than anybody else who maybe didn't have the opportunity because at the end of the day, it is highly competitive and you you're replaceable. And we hate to say that about individuals. We are human beings. You are unique in who you are as an individual and in the industry of film and acting, it's a really easy to find somebody else who's similar enough that will get the job done for that production person. So remember what their job is here for, appreciate and respect their role as the production person and try and fill your role as best you can if you're being given that opportunity. Let me, let me give an example of what we're talking about. In that film, they cast me as that North Korean leader, but I have no illusion that I was the best for that role. You know, there's a joke, how many actors does it take to replace a light bulb? And you've heard that, it takes a hundred, right? I haven't heard that, but that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah, it takes one actor to change the light bulb and the other 99 actors to say, I could have done that. And that is true. There are probably thousands of people that could have done what I did in that film. So I have no illusions that I was the best. But for whatever reason, the gods of Hollywood asked me to do it, and I did it. Now, once it's done, once it's on film, then it can never be changed. Then you become, yeah, he's the character. He's the best person for that character. Example, Indiana Jones and the, ten, you know, these uh, Indiana Jones characters, they could have hired, cast somebody else. But once the, it was set on film, you cannot imagine anybody else playing that role. So... That's how that ball rolls. Until you get cast, yeah, you could say, I could have done it. And sincerely, they could have done it. But they, if they didn't do it, I did it. And so it's now memorialized in film. But that's the way the business is. Fair. That's a great example. And thank you for elaborating and sharing that with us. Was there any particular schooling or education that you needed to receive in order to do your role effectively? And if so, can you share some of that with us? Sure. In general, every role is unique, requiring different approach and preparations, obviously. And therefore, so-called education has no direct correlation or prerequisite. But when you're doing a when you when you're doing a character, it's more of understanding who the character is and what that character is about in a film. And if you can process that intellectually, then you don't need a college degree or a graduate degree. Many people have not gone to college, but they understand who the character is or what the character does in the context of the storyline and the film. In that case, you really don't need so you know a specialized education in a broadly, uh, I guess, broad manner. Now, there are two types of acting in film, and this is where we kind of separate the categories. Um, one is theater acting. Now, if you're interested in uh, performing on live stage, like on Broadway, then you do need training in acting because it is very specialized. For example, it's live acting on stage requires a different skill set from film or TV, such as projecting. 
Now, what this means is that if you're, pro if you're performing on stage, say Radio City Music Hall, then everything you do on stage needs to be done in such a manner that the people in the very last row of the very last upper deck can see what you're doing. So when you are reacting to a situation, you can't just go, yeah, because people in the back row cannot see you. All they see is you just standing there. So in terms of projection, the actor has to go, yeah. Then people in the back realize, oh, you know, he's, he's saying something. But on TV, when you go like this, it looks awkward because TV catches every, the camera catches everything you see. So it requires different theater, uh, different acting skill to do theater. And that's Shakespearean type of thing. You know, it's just, it's a lot more intense. And of course, uh, good theater actors sometimes do not transition to good film actors because they can't separate the differences. But the ones who can separate and make that adjustment can go both ways. Now, for TV, it requires a different set of skills, which is that because you're dealing with a camera pretty much, and everything you do on camera is it seems bigger and larger than life. So an actor does not need to use broad gestures, for example, to get you know uh, seen across. So say, there's a scene where the actor has to react kind of a undesirable manner. So the person may, the camera will, you know, shoot the person in the face and he may just go like this. That's in disapproval, right? But if you do what? And, it, and then it becomes overkill because the TV captures too much of it. So it's a very uh, different approach to different mediums as to how you need to do what you need to do. Sure. If you overact on TV, then you lose credibility because it's a very subtle thing, you know? And if you don't understand the dif difference, then you're not gonna come across well. You have to also keep in mind when you're on set, the director has certain vision of what kind of a shot he wants. So he may want a broad shot. So you, you know, and on these large films, you know, $135 million film, you get cameras right in front of your face some are 10 feet away. Others are on a crane way in the back, about 50 feet away, right? And you think that because crane, the camera is on a crane 50 feet behind, you know, ahead of you or behind you, that you have to do grand gestures. No, because the camera zooms right in. Even though the camera itself is 50 feet away, pulls right into your face. So if you don't understand that, you feel like you want to compensate for that distance, then you're gonna you're not gonna come across well because the camera is gonna pull in, zoom right in, and see your face. So these are things that take time to adjust and to understand. This goes back to my initial point. You have to have a broader understanding of what it takes to be an actor. It's not just trying to be cute. You know, you have to really understand the medium. Otherwise, you're not gonna uh, come around. That's so good. Thank you for sharing with us those minute differences between yeah. stage acting and film acting. And one more, my, my, my final point on here is that films or TVs, your know, entertainment industry goes in cycles. Uh, what's hot now will not be two, three years from now. So what I'm saying is that what you offer as an actor may not be in right now, but a year from now, you may be the hottest commodity, you see? So Using that ocean wave as an example, ride the wave when it comes. But when the wave doesn't come, it has nothing to do with you. Don't take it personal because it's not personal. It's a societal thing. It's whatever, for, for whatever reason, the industry is shifting one way or another. So in the end, to me, it takes four things. Luck, talent, timing, and perseverance. LTTP. However, it takes more than luck. It takes more than talent. It takes more than timing. It takes more than perseverance. It takes all of these simultaneously. You see. So if you understand these, so if you understand these points and you still want to pursue the profession of acting, then do it. Because then one day in the future, society may see you on TV or in film. But keep in mind. 
fame is fleeting. Mm -hmm. Someone once said, success is not final and failure is not fatal because successes and failures come and go. So you need to realize that being an actor or an actress is a journey, not a destination because you don't ever arrive. It's an ongoing process. So you need to become an actor or actress for the love of it, not for the fame or the destination. Excellent, excellent. Excellent points. I love that you uh, tapped into and reminded us that it's a fickle character, right? Fame is fickle just like inspiration can be fickle. So just to ride that wave and don't take it too personal, but don't give up either. If you're in one of those scenarios where it seems like it's just not ticking through for you yet, don't walk away from it because it's just the other side of the next one that might turn into something for you. So keep yeah. going. Yeah. W.C. Fields, who was an actor in the 30s or in 40s, once said, be nice to people on your way up because you will meet them on your way down. <laughs> and that is the truth right there, for sure. Hey, Augustus, what has been your favorite thing about this chosen career path? It's a unique life experience. It's unlike anything else in life as far as work, work goes or profession goes. Because it's so specialized. People behind the camera are so specialized and so knowledgeable about what they're doing. Not only that, it takes large moving parts to make a film that you see during the weekends at your favorite movie theater, but they make it work. And when you see at the end of the movie, everybody, as soon as the end comes, they all leave the you know, theater and they wanna to go to the bathroom, whatever. But in reality, if you're a real film buff, you realize those names, sometimes hundreds of names that they credit, it took that many people to make that film, good or bad, Either way, to produce that film, it starts with a, a chauffeur that picks you up at the airport, drops you off back and forth to the caters, to the electrician. I mean, everybody comes together to produce that one film. So the production team often goes under uh, unappreciated or underappreciated. But see, actors and actresses have the easiest part. We just show up with our lines. And if we understand our character, then that's what we deliver. And that's what people see. But without the people behind the camera, actors are worthless, useless, you see. So we have to keep in mind that we're not the star. There, I mean, stars a stupid concept. We're all characters, but unless people behind the camera actually do their job and their job well, we're nobodies. But yes, society only focuses on people that they see in the front. I guess it's okay. But people that are really movie files and they're people that really love cinema realize, no, it's, it's bigger than that. I mean, it's, it's larger pieces. Only pieces that they see in public is our face, but without the people in the background, nothing gets done. Movies are like an iceberg. You only see the 15% at the top of the water. The other 85% is, is under the water. And the, the other 85% of the production team, that little 15% is our faces. So as an actor or actress, appreciate the production team because they make what you do possible. Because without them, it doesn't happen. And that goes same for the film, film sets or TVs, show, TV shows or anything else in terms of whatever Hollywood does. So keep that in mind. And having said that, it's a lot of fun being on a multi-million dollar film set, being surrounded by fellow actors who are extremely talented. You've seen these people. I mean, the people that I work with were on Disney, you know, and all these other shows. So it's fun trading, you know, kind of a war stories, you know, what, what's going on, this and that, all the insights and who, who's doing what and who's a nice actor, who's, who's not a nice actor. I mean, it's kind of fun, kind of an industry kind of a thing. But the other part is the food, the catering service is awesome. They actually bring in trucks from LA on these large productions and from four o'clock on, you're eating. But unfortunately you gotta control that because like, I don't like, I mean, the food, I mean, I had, uh, eggs, salmon with uh, avocado on, uh, I feel which covering was for breakfast twice a day, whatever it is. And then you just order whatever you want, you know, and then, you know, they'll have it. 
it's it's an awesome, awesome experience. But these are for the principal characters, not for the extras or day players. Obviously, they don't get that. They get you know whatever snacks that they uh, the company decides to give them. And to have your own trailer to rest in, because you know people think that acting is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. But if you ask anybody, can you act? They will say yes, I can act. And I don't. I, I believe them. I don't discard them because they probably can act. And if you ask any sixth, seventh, and eighth grader, can you act? They'll tell you yes. And they're most likely right that they can act. But here's the problem. Can you act at one o'clock in the morning when you're shooting? Can you act after four hours of waiting in a trailer to get everything for the production team to get everything ready? Then it becomes a different ball game. You're tired. You don't want to act. You know, often being an actor is like football team in the locker room where the coach gives you inspirational speech. You're going to go out there and blah, blah, this, this, and that, right? And when that door opens, you want to bust out and, and, and you know, play football. Well, actors have to be like that. We're like racehorses in that little, you know, place waiting for the gate to open so we can bust out. But sometimes we're in that gate for four hours getting ready until the gate opens. We don't act until the director says, go. But director will tell you, he's not gonna tell you to go until all the things are set up. And sometimes it takes 30 minutes. Sometimes it takes an hour and a half. Sometimes the machine breaks down. Well, guess what? We all have to wait until that gets fixed. And you, you got your line, you memorized, you're ready to go, but you can't do it. And you're supposed to shoot that scene at 4 p.m. Now it's 9 p.m. And you're tired just from waiting. It's exhausting. And these are your unique problems that the actors have. And I'm not saying, I'm not being, I'm not trying to make it more difficult than it is, but you're tired. If they shot that at four o'clock, I would have done a great job. I'm fresh, bam. But that didn't happen. Now we got to wait until nine o'clock. We were tired. But if you're a professional, you come across just like you would at four o'clock. You say that line just like you did at four o'clock, the initial master tape, and then you do it again and again and again. So for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, yeah, you can act in front of your iPhone and act cute, but can you do that when you're really, really tired? It's a different ball game. Oh, yeah. Professionals are professionals because they act when they don't want to act, but they have to act. And you do it very well because that's what you do. And that's what separates children acting versus real live acting, you see. Yeah. And, and not only that, it takes a lot of effort and energy to bring that character to life. It's not who you are. You referenced that earlier. It's not who you are. So there is a lot of effort and energy that goes into getting into that headspace, to being able to fulfill that role the way that that director needs you to. And then you have this hurry up and wait concept. And uh, you hurry up, you get all your lines memorized, your makeup's done, your wardrobe's on, you're ready to go. And the scene isn't ready. So now you're sitting there waiting and slowly, but surely over time, you either start to lose your lines or you start to lose touch with that character. So then you're working constantly to stay in that character. That would be really exhausting to try and keep all of that up for sure. It's a good sometimes, thing they provide trailers. Yes. Sometimes you have a 12 hour day, you know, you, you, uh, you, you get, you wake up at four in the morning then you get driven to the set maybe an hour away, you know, limousine, whatever it is. And when you get there, then they, they put on your makeup and all these other things, and then you're ready by seven o'clock. But production is behind for whatever reason. So you're waiting. And then they have to make up for the lost time. Then it's now lunchtime. So you have, you have to eat, but you can't eat well, because if you eat too much, then you're going to get sleepy. And you made a, you know, you may not do a good job. So even the food is great and it's very tempting. You have to have self-control. So you have to kind of, you know, go with what the pace is. So number of things goes on. A lot of unpredictable things happen in filming. But in the end, it's a great experience. It's a lot of fun. And once you do it, you have this immense feeling of satisfaction that you have somehow contributed your part, your little part to the film that everyone put together. And that's a wonderful film, a wonderful feeling. 
Yeah, you get to be part of a team. If you had one piece of advice that you would give your younger self that would have made your journey into acting a little bit easier, what might that be? You know, my journey in the industry has been pretty good. I've been uh, I've done the entire spectrum from, you know, huge blockbuster to uh, college student films and in between and what it's like. So I got a broad experience in terms of the big picture, because after a while you realize it's all the same. Different background, different camera person, but pretty much the same. So as, after a certain point, it becomes the same thing all over again. And in that case, you know, how many times do I need to do this to realize, oh, this is what it is, right? So at that point, you move on to, you want to do something else and you move on. But my advice to young people today is don't lose track of the big picture of life because you can lose yourself quite easily with the people that you meet. They're all trying to lead you by the nose. And if you don't really know who you are, you're going to fall for it. But in the end, you have to understand the entertainment industry is a business. Now, granted, it's a unusual business and it can impact society, unlike selling you know, basketball shoes, but it's still a business because it is driven by the profit margin of the production company and less so by Hollywood's inherent commitment to better human existence or to pursue artistic values. Those are all secondary or whatever down the line. Because for example, if producing cartoons sell, they will produce that because it's about the bottom line. So if you're an individual and you're not willing to sell your soul to General Motors or IBM for their profit margins, then why would you as an actor or actress sell your soul for a role? It's just another business in the end. So it's very important that you uh, maintain self-respect and dignity as an actor or actress and keep your clothes on because the best movies ever produced are created by good storylines and good quality acting but not showing skin. If you have to show skin, that indicates the quality or lack of quality of that storyline or the production company. So always maintain self-respect and dignity, whatever happens. And remember, don't let society define who you are. In other words, don't let your role and whatever uh, role that you get define who you are. Instead, you have to define yourself. Because problem with, with society is that people identify themselves by what they do, not who they are, you see. And being a banker doesn't make him or her better than a sanitation worker in society. Why? Because I guarantee you, if trash doesn't get collected for a month, then you will all of a sudden come to the quick realization how valuable sanitation workers are in society maybe sometimes more important than bankers, you see. So in the end, one profession is not more valuable than another. That means Hollywood is not any more valuable than another because everyone fulfills a necessary role in society that we all live in. So being an actor or actress is another function of that society and no more or no less important than any other, okay? So hopefully, you will keep that in mind as you pursue your dream of becoming an actor or actress. Excellent things to keep in mind. Thank you so much, Augustus. This has been a wonderful conversation. Leaving a comment in the messages below if you would like to reach out because you have additional questions. You're not prying and you're not trying to um, just get an autograph or anything. That's not what this is for. This is just an opportunity for you as a developing person, individual, to maybe ask a question that I forgot to ask or didn't get a chance to ask today. Augustus, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for being with us. For all of you that are watching verse on High Point Friends School Facebook page or YouTube channel, thanks for tuning in to be with us today. We really appreciate you. If this conversation has served you or your student, please just let us know. Leave us a comment below, like and subscribe, share this conversation with your friends and family. 
We want to help inspire our middle school students and keep them engaged throughout the summer. Now, if you're wondering if your student is a good fit for High Point Friends School, reach out to Pam Horn. The contact information is in the bar below the screen and uh, it will be in the descriptions as well. Until next time, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in and watching. Have a fantastic rest of your day.